On the Saturday night after Donald Trump's stunning presidential victory over Hillary Clinton, Saturday Night Live decided to forego its mandate, you know, humor, in favor of a full-on political wake. Kate McKinnon, who has done a creditable job mocking Clinton for most of the election cycle, led off the show with a full rendition of the recently deceased Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. There were zero laughs and lots of delicious, delicious celebrity tears. McKinnon wasn't the only one crying, by the way. Lady Gaga, who introduced Clinton at her last pre-election rally, apparently wept openly backstage as Clinton lost on election night. So did Cher. Katy Perry was so overcome, she then skipped singing the national anthem and actually donated a bunch of money to Planned Parenthood. True story. Lena Dunham of Girls, and bragging about sexually abusing her sister in her memoir fame, she penned an open letter, quote, I touched my face and realized I was crying. Can we please go home? I said to my boyfriend. I could tell he was having trouble breathing, and I could feel my chin breaking into hives. At home, I got in the shower and began to cry even harder. My boyfriend, who had already wept, watched me as I mumbled incoherently clutching myself. To put it mildly, <laughs> or to put it slightly less mildly, <laughs> the left spent its time during this election cycle lecturing Americans from the Hollywood Hills. It didn't work. After years of President Obama traipsing into studios in L.A. to read mean tweets, after nearly a decade of listening to the sophomoric unearned moral superiority of actors and actresses who earn millions for reading lines other people write. After watching 9-11 truther rappers go to the White House, Americans said no to celebrity culture by electing a celebrity, because that's what we do. The great irony of Trump's victory is that he was actually an anti-celebrity celebrity. He had all the perks of celebrity, but he reveled in them. He didn't try to claim he was a better human being than the white middle-class voters in Wisconsin by virtue of living in New York in a penthouse covered in gold leaf. Trump played the everyman on television, and it worked. Meanwhile, celebrities who didn't grow up in tremendous wealth hobnobbed with the elites. Singers and actresses taped a fight song rendition for the DNC. Dunham appeared on stage at the convention, sans her sister. Beyonce and Jay-Z campaigned for Clinton. So did Bruce Springsteen. And all of them did so for a woman whose closest contact with flyover country came during one highly choreographed stop at Chipotle. Americans may never get over their obsession with celebrity, but they sure don't want to hear those celebrities talk down to them. America has disconnected itself from rural America. And rural Americans were more than willing to punish Hollywood for that grave sin. If Democrats hope to win down the road, they're going to have to do better than trotting out the scornful glitterati. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Oh, so much to get to today. So much to talk about. First, we have to say hello to our sponsors over at Wink.com. So if you don't know anything about wine, what a good wine is, what a bad wine is, but you know kind of what you like in terms of food and drink, then go to trywink.com, trywink.com. It's spelled W-I-N-C, trywink.com slash Ben. And they get $20 off. The way that it works is you go there, they do a brief survey. They say kind of what foods do you like, and then they recommend wines that are based on the kinds of foods you like and the kind of dinner you're expecting to have. So they do all the expertise work for you. Their wine apparently is really good. Everybody at the office has tried it. They're all drunk all the time from Wink Wine, which is why the podcast is so bad. But trywink.com slash Ben is the place to go, W-I-N-C.com. They brand their own wine. They make it. Uh, and apparently, according to all the people at the office, it is indeed top-notch, $20 off right now, and it's personalized to your palate. So it's not just you ordering wine. It's actually personalized to the kind of wine that you'll like, uh, and it is a pretty spectacular service. Try wink.com slash Ben. Okay, lots and lots to get to today here on the Ben Shapiro Show. So first of all, got to give you the update from what happened at DePaul. So last night, DePaul University, I'm supposed to speak there, and the way that we were working this is, as you recall, six months ago, there's a big hubbub at DePaul because Milo Yiannopoulos spoke at DePaul, and a bunch of the students rushed the stage, and they took over the stage, and they were yelling at him, and the security didn't do anything. And, uh, and then the administration decided to fire the president of the university, basically, for having allowed that lecture. And they issued a blanket ban, not only on Milo, but on me. And I wasn't even there. I didn't do anything. But they didn't like the fact that there was a riot, near riot, at Cal State LA when I spoke there, and at Penn State when I spoke there. And they said, we just can't handle this. We just can't handle this. So they issue this blanket ban. So the Young America's Foundation chapter, they go to the administration. They say, we'd like to have Shapiro speak. And the administration says, nah. And so instead, what they do is they set up a lecture with Christina Hoff Summers, who's a wonderful, fabulous human being, love Christina, uh, and she's the anti-third wave feminist professor, and they have her come and speak, and she was going to be accompanied by me. So halfway through, she was going to hand over the microphone to me, and we were going to do an event to get around the band. So DePaul finds out about this a couple of days beforehand, and they say, we're going to shut down the event unless you ban Shapiro, unless you re-ban Shapiro. So they say, okay, well, 
what if Shapiro just he's already here? What if Shapiro just comes as a guest and listens to Christina Hoff Summers? And the administration says, no, he can't even be in the room. He can't even come into the room. We're not going to allow that. And they say, well, what if he comes as a member of Christina's team, like just the people who hang around with her? No, they wouldn't allow that either. So the situation yesterday when I did the podcast was that the administration was literally threatening to arrest me if I walked onto campus. They were literally threatening to arrest me if I walked onto campus. So the way that we worked it was this. Christina went inside the hall, and she started her speech. And then I came up afterward because I wanted to see if these people were actually serious about shutting down free speech. I'm giving a speech, by the way about free speech, right? The speech is actually about free speech. And I wanted to see if they were actually willing to arrest me. Turns out they were because fascism is alive and well on America's college campuses. Here is the, the video of what happened last night at DePaul University. How are you? I'm the public safety. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. You know that you weren't registered or whatever for the group didn't register for an event. They have strict things, so you're Soviet not allowed. allowed. Well, I mean, YAF did inform you that I was coming as a speaker, as a as a person sitting in the audience, as well as as a member of uh, Christina Hoff Summers' team. So, uh, I'm not sure whether their standards are necessary. I'm also wondering exactly why it's so necessary to keep me personally out. We're just following protocol, sir. Uh, well, why is your protocol to keep me specifically out? What country protocol? Soviet Union or United States? Do you want to step over here to the side? Well, I'm, I'm happy to do it right here if, you, if you'd like. I mean, it doesn't have to step private. The bottom line is it's private property, okay? That I'm the good, wasn't fully aware. proper procedures weren't followed, and you're not going to allow them. So, am I to understand that if I take three steps forward, you will attempt to have me arrested? If you create a problem and you will not, you know, leave the campus, yes. Okay, so just to be just to be clear, if I attempt to enter that hall right there and sit down just to listen to somebody speak. Or if I attempt to ask a question so, or to engage in free speech, you will have me arrested. I think at this point, yes, sir. Okay. I'm, I'm glad that we've uh, clarified that situation. I'm also glad that uh, in a city, I mean, clearly you have great security. I'm glad in a city that has uh, some 4,000 shootings to this date, you have 30 members of security just for a 59165 Jewish guy. <laughs> <laughs> just like maybe a mild allocation of resources. Well, okay. Well, if that's why we're going to do this, then we'll just do the event elsewhere, folks. So yeah. follow us. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We we went to you, this giant crowd, and we walked over to a theater that was about four blocks away, and we did the event there. I Skyped into Christina in the hall, and she said, okay, everybody up and out. Everybody got up, walked off the DePaul campus, and went somewhere where, they, where they're not fascists. It is an amazing thing, right? It wasn't that they were banning me because I didn't have an RSVP. They knew I was coming, clearly. That's why the security was there, right? It wasn't like they weren't aware. By the way, how many protesters were there there? How many protesters? They had to protect the protesters from me. Right. And that was the, the idea. I'm a very violent person. As, as you come to know me over the course of the last year, I love violence so much that I've denounced every candidate who has engaged in any violent rhetoric the entire campaign. I, but I am a, a deep threat. I mean, I've got the karate skills. Oh, yeah. So they were afraid that I was going to just start jumping on people and wailing on them or something. So in any case, I go there, the, the Jewish Chainsaw Massacre. I show up. And they literally have 30 security guards, and the sheriff from Cook County is there as well. Because the way that this works, legally speaking, is campus security can't actually arrest anybody. They can detain me. Then they have to have the sheriff take me to jail. So they actually had brought the sheriff of Cook County there just for me. I felt very special. So they had 30 members of security, plus a sheriff from Cook County, and about five cops who were sitting in a cop car down the street just for little old me. And I have to admit... And I never thought of myself as a, as a security threat that way. It's kind of empowering. They thought I was going to turn into the Hulk and turn green and wear purple pants. But it is amazing. And again, there were this many protesters. This many. There were zero protesters. None. Not a zilch. No protesters at all. But they've internalized the demands of the rioters and the protesters so much that they didn't arrest any of the rioters and protesters when they destroyed Milo's speech six months ago. There weren't any tonight, but the administration still threatened to arrest me if I had tried to step onto, onto the campus. So, you know, there are people saying that I should have gotten myself arrested just for the shtick of it. Okay, first of all, I'm not going to, to get arrested just for the sake of getting arrested because it was clear they were going to arrest me. They had, one of the people there was actually suggesting the reason that that fellow you see there, the security guy, was attempting to bring me aside in that tape is he wanted to get me over onto the grass off a public walkway. He wanted to actually have me step over onto the grass. And at that point, everybody tackles me. <laughs> I was not interested uh, in doing that. Also, I was not interested in not having cameras there. Cameras are wonderful. They, they 
make clear to everybody exactly what's going on. But that's the nature of campus fascism in today's America. Today, I'm scheduled to speak at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Apparently, there are three separate groups that are going to be doing protests, which is just fine. I'm happy to have protesters. That's free speech. But they're also very, very upset that the speech is open to the public. Apparently, it's going to be a packed hall. It's like 500 seats, and it's supposed to be packed. And they're very upset that members of the general public want to come. And so lefties are trying to shut down the event on the grounds that the general public shouldn't be allowed to come. So that's the way this works now. Free speech on college campuses is dead. Megan Kelly uh, was uh, kind enough to have me on her show last night. And here's how that looked. Here we go again, Ben. Here we go again. <laughs> it's incredible how, I mean, time after time, these college campuses won't even let you speak because you get shouted down by intolerant people when you try to go, and then they say it's a security concern. Yeah, it really is amazing. This one was actually particularly amazing because there wasn't a protester anywhere in sight. So you had 30 security people but they could, and a they sheriff could picture from one in their heads. Right, exactly. So they'd actually internalized the, the rioters so well that now they could actually reflect them back out to the world. They're tolerant of anything except somebody actually giving a speech on the topic of free speech. That is the actual topic Can of we speech just that I was Say that again. Say that again. The speech that I was giving was about free speech, and they are tolerant enough to ban it. So that was exciting. It's unbelievable. You were not allowed to speak about free speech at all. This is what modern day university campuses have come to. Not in all cases. There's the University of Chicago that denied people their safe spaces. But in, in this case, so you showed up there to make a point about free speech and you were arrested. Now, does this have any public dollars coming its way, this, this university? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a private university, which is why I didn't actually just attempt to walk right past security. If yeah. it's a public university, then it would have done so under my First Amendment rights. Exactly. It's a private university. So once they'd made clear that I would be arrested if I took th two steps forward, then what I did instead is Christina Hoff Summers, who joined me at this at this lecture, she actually Skyped me into the lecture hall, oh. and then we told everybody in the lecture hall to get up and walk out, and we all walked over to a, to a theater that was about three blocks away and did the event anyway. What, what, do, what do the kids who... If there are kids who are protesting, young adults, your presence, say. Do you know? Well, I mean, I, I think that they're, they're just offended by, by anybody who has a differing point of view. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow at University of Wisconsin at Madison, and one of the key reasons that they're protesting me, apparently the big protests are planned, is because I'm pro-Trump, which is weird since I wasn't. So it, it, it's pretty they're, they're just making things up. Yeah, yeah exactly. right, so. exactly. And then they, they will left, let controversial figures from the left come and speak. It's just not somebody who's got strong views from the right. We've seen it so many times. Ben, good for you for trying. Thanks for being here. Okay, so it was fun and games. Over at University of Wisconsin-Madison, apparently the hubbub has started. This is a letter from a state senator in Wisconsin. You ready for this? This is breaking news. State senator in Wisconsin, Dewey Strobel, he just wrote this letter uh, directly to the, um, to the folks at, at, state of, at, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. It says, quote, For weeks, the Young Americans for Freedom at UW-Madison have been meticulously planning an event with conservative commentator and New York Times bestselling author Ben Shapiro. In recent days, the campus conservatives have come under attack from ultra-left agitators. These liberals have invited hundreds to a private Facebook group page titled F White Supremacy Interrupting Ben Shapiro. Now a complaint has been filed against the organization stating they broke a university policy by advertising the event to the public. In an advising meeting, Center for Leadership and Involvement staff advised the conservatives that student organization events are open only to the campus community, students, faculty, and staff, and in order to open an event to the public, an apartment must sponsor. The staff also informed the students a portion of the complaint alleges the group targeted a member of the campus community by sharing a publicly available Facebook post. While opposing students are filing frivolous grumbles to the, to the staff, it appears the university is welcoming to protesters, however, not members of the public looking to listen to Mr. Shapiro. Senator Strobel said, at a taxpayer-funded university, Madison should make efforts to have more events open to the public. It is important student organizations have the ability to, without cumbersome red tape, host events to include the public. Every time university officials lobby my office for more taxpayer resources, they argue how important the school is to the state. Student organizations should have the freedom, without fear of complaints, to create a larger discussion within the broader public community. The CFLI, which is the, the staff, should dismiss this grievance as baseless. Complaints are not to be used as a weapon against organizations with different viewpoints. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. But this is the way it works on college campuses. Look, I wasn't for Trump. You want to know why Trump won? It's because of bull crap like this. This is the reason Trump won. People just got sick of all the nonsense that the left was pushing, the safe spaces, and they shut it all down, and the political correctness. All of that nonsense 
that's gone by the wayside. Americans just aren't interested in it anymore. And that I can certainly appreciate about the Trump campaign and about the support for Trump, because it is clear that across the country, the left, the fascistic left, is interested in shutting down anything remotely resembling freedom of discussion. Now, along those lines, and now along those lines, uh, I think that it is important to note that the media continue to make absolute asses of themselves. It is amazing. You know, I, again, I, I keep saying it because I think that it's important to point out where my biases are. I'm not a person who backed Donald Trump in the primaries or in the general election. So when I say that the media are targeting Trump, I think that you can take that with full honesty. Right? I don't have an interest in, in, propping, up, in propping up Trump. I have an interest in him succeeding as a conservative. That would be great. But I don't have an interest in, in BSing for him as so many others do. When I say the media are out to get this guy, they are out to get this guy, and they're doing it in the stupidest possible way. So, for example, Chris Matthew, I'm having a say. Man, comes out of a show, gets up in the morning, running in the studio. Then he looks at this, he looks at the teleprompter, oh my God, John Bolton's gonna be secretary. He said, it's crazy. John Bolton, taking up my leg, John Bolton, he got a mustache. What kind of mustache does that look like a walrus? Chris Matthews, MSNBC, go. Trump Watch, November 14th. 2016. I can feel much of the country's mood right now. On Saturday Night Live, Kate McKinnon sang Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And then again on church on Sunday night, the choir sang it again. Because much of America is in a soulful mood right now, but some of it's all right, or actually downright scared. Our son was marching in this weekend protest against the election. And through this, right through this, I try hard to do this job. And tonight I worry about the talk that John Bolton might be Trump's choice for Secretary of State. Picking Bolton would have an immediate effect. It would vastly increase the number of people who are sad at what happened last Tuesday and the number of people who are downright scared. Okay, it's going to scare everybody. It's unbelievable. Picking this Bolton guy with his mustache and his crazy hair. I mean, look at me. Just let me finish. Let me finish. It says so right on the screen. Let me finish. I want to finish. Chris Matthews, I'm say, Mike Lissikoff, what do you think? Kathleen, get the hotel room ready. I'm coming home, stick my head under a pillow. I'm gonna never shower, because that messes up my hair too much. Gotta brush with a show. Chris Matthews, man. Okay, so the point there, of course, is that I love this. Donald Trump is scary enough, but John Bolton is the one who's truly scaring people. It will vastly increase the number of people who are sad. Oh God, no, not sadness. And somewhere Donald Trump is going, like I care about your sadness. Your tears nourish me. Yes. <laughs> but this is the point. The media are so ridiculous that they, if they're suggesting that Americans are going to be deeply, deeply upset about the appointment of John Bolton, Secretary of State, the former U.N. ambassador under George W. Bush, this is just nuts. It's just nuts. But the problem is this. The media treated every conservative proposal for the last 15 years, really since, since Bush was elected in 2000, as anathema and as evil and as Hitlerian. And so now... They just have to keep upping the ante, but there's nowhere to up the ante. I mean, Trump is as bad as it's going to get for them in terms of somebody who they hate, but they're still trying to up the ante to John Bolton. It just doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. It's like what these protesters are trying to do at these campuses. Donald Trump's super, super scary, but Shapiro's even scarier. In what world? In what? No one believes that. What are you talking about? Okay, that's just one aspect of the media losing their mind and destroying their own credibility. Here's another one. The, the media lost their mind yesterday because Donald Trump ditched them and went out to dinner with his family at a steakhouse. Okay, so there's something called, I guess, the, the emergency press pool. And what that means is that there's always somebody from the press traveling with Trump in case there's an emergency, like let's say that he were out to dinner and suddenly there were a nuclear attack or something. Okay, first of all, he's the president-elect. He can't do anything yet, right? He's just the president-elect. But he ditches them and he goes to have a steak dinner and the media lose their minds. Like Americans care about this. Here are the media just going nuts over it. The president-elect just left without telling pretty much anyone anything. Is that right? That is correct. His press pool was given a lid for the evening, which normally suggests that Donald Trump isn't going anywhere. He's sticking around Trump Tower. But Trump apparently had other plans. He decided to go out to dinner without alerting some of his key staffers as well as the press. And it appears to be yet another misunderstanding of exactly how much gravity his new title as president-elect holds. You know, if, God forbid, something were to happen to him, that is a matter not only of public record, but also a matter of national security, given that he is next in line to take the White House. Well, indeed, it may be, seems like. And then Rachel Maddow does the same thing. It, it, so they, they're all going nuts over this. How could it possibly be? How could we possibly let Donald Trump get out of our sights? What a terror. OK, no one cares. You know how many people in America care that Rachel Maddow and crew couldn't shadow Donald Trump at the dinner? What do you think is going to happen? He's going to get there. and He's going to be like, pass the A1 sauce right now. 
and then someone doesn't pass the A1 sauce, he breaks it off into a jagged edge and then shoves it in their in their jugular, and then he gets impeached before he's on. And this is just silly talk. It's silly. Talk. That's not even the limit of it. In one moment, believe it or not, you're going to have to hear me defend Steve Bannon. I know. I can't believe it either. But that's what this media has come to. I'll talk about that in just a second. But first, I have to give a shout out to our sponsors over at birchgold.com. So birchgold.com, if you're concerned about the future of the country, if you are concerned that the, uh, that the Fed is going to raise interest rates, the stock market is inflated, the real estate market's inflated, then you need to go over to my friends at birchgold.com slash Ben. It's birchgold.com slash Ben, A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. They'll teach you how to invest in precious metals, and they will also help you get that, the, put your precious metals from a four, get, get out of your 401k if you want to and put it in precious metals tax-free. Ask all your questions, make sure that you have all your questions answered, and then invest with my friends over at birchgold.com slash Ben. Okay, before we take off, I just have to make one quick note about, one more quick note about the media. The media have over, over, wildly overplayed their hands on Steve Bannon. So, as one of the leading Bannon critics in America, okay, somebody who worked with Steve Bannon for years, I think that Steve Bannon is a, is a vicious, very bad guy. I think Steve Bannon uh, is vindictive. I think he likes to, to destroy people. I think it's, it's what he loves to do. I think he also used Breitbart as a, as a way to ingratiate himself with Trump to the point where he undercut his own reporters. And I think that he, used, he, he was happy to allow Breitbart to pander to the alt-right. And the alt-right, as I've said a thousand times on the show, the alt-right are people who believe that the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, those are passe, and instead what we need is a Eurocentric white nationalism. So does that mean that, that he is an anti-Semite? No. Does it mean Breitbart is a white nationalist site? No, it doesn't. It means that they've pandered to white nationalists in, in some of their writing and in some of the things that they do. They've pandered to, to some of the people who are warm to Richard Spencer and Jared Taylor and that group. Does that mean the entire site is white nationalist? No, of course not. Does it mean that the entire site uh, is reflection of V-Dare? No, it doesn't. And, but the media can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. So instead of just saying, here's what troubles me about Bannon, the hollowing out of traditional conservatism, traditional constitutional conservatism in favor of European far-right populism, which doesn't care about the size of government, which doesn't worry about the size and scope of government, it just worries most specifically about shutting down the borders and increasing tariffs. They, that's all they care about, European far-right populism. If that is a problem for you, right? They, they don't, but they're not criticizing that, right? They're not criticizing that aspect of Bannon. They're not criticizing the aspect of Bannon that he's really vicious and that he may use the government as a, as a method of going after old enemies, considering that he, he's, again, one of the most more vindictive people in the business. No, instead, they have to go full Hitler. They have to go full Hitler. And we'll explain all of that if you go over to dailywire.com. Uh, if you go over to dailywire.com right now uh, and you subscribe, become a subscriber, uh, it's $8 a month. And uh, that allows you also to get rid of all the ads on the site, which is pretty cool. Uh, $8 a month allows you access to the rest of this show live. It allows you the rest of, of Andrew Clavin's show live. It allows you to become part of the mailbag. Uh, and uh, if you get an annual subscription right now, you still get a signed copy uh, of my new novel, True Allegiance. So check that out right now over at, uh, over at our website, dailywire.com. Become a subscriber. Become part of the team, part of the largest conservative podcast in America.